So quick introduction for Janet, who I'm really pleased to uh, share the, the podium with today because we've always met <laughs> wherever, here, London, other places. <laughs> Janet roams around the world and makes her work within and outside of institutions. And I'm really pleased to have a, get a really good insight into your work today. So um, Janet is based in Sydney, um, where she currently also holds a residency at the uh, Australian Museum. And uh, you can see her work in Berlin at the Eger, still on, at Marzahn, so that would be a great opportunity. If you are from the Friesian part of Germany, then uh, you might want to go to Oldenburg, where there's also a work of hers as a, as a result of the um, residency at the Hanse Wissenschaftskolleg as well. So um, thank you very much, Janet. And, uh... Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me here. I'm really delighted to be here. It's such a wonderful... Such a wonderful um, um, conference to be at. I, um, my work for years has really uh, explored the poetics of space um, and materiality through the creation of site-specific works predominantly within and outside of museums. And I'm expanding the idea of working with natural history museums into also, I work a lot with the collections and I take the collections into other places. And often the collection, the space of the collection becomes very much my studio. So I wanted to start today with a work that's actually within the botanical gardens, which is of course a sort of museum. But one of the wonderful things I love with working with museums is um, researching with the scientists because I'm always learning as I go, as I'm making, I'm developing so much um, understanding of things and so things change and evolve as they're made. So this is actually a little hospital for ailing plants because really I feel that in the, at the moment in the fragility of our natural world in this age of the Anthropocene, I feel compelled to make works that addresses what can art possibly do for that? Can art have a healing role um, in, in this? And so within this little museum uh, that sits outside in a sort of transparent mesh house, again, all the development of the works based on working with plant pathologists um, is this little hospital with 33 wards that go from maternity to intensive care. There's a morgue, there's an emergency, there's all the wards because actually it's a very public place, the botanical gardens. And um, they're at the attendants there in white coats, of course, looking after the plants. And they invite people in to also care for the plants. So it becomes like a little model for the environment, how we have to care for the environment. And I'm really asking this question, can art have an aesthetics of care, can it actually um, bring this empathy into our living world and through natural history objects, which I feel can extend the life of objects. So this little hospital for several months was in this garden and then everything that died then became transformed in my studio and then I also got some natural history specimens. I actually bought them in auction, I bought owls and other little creatures and other plant matter, which is all completely dead. And it lives now in an, in an art museum amongst um, 18th and 19th century paintings in Australia about the colonial um, plunder of the land, the landscape so recently that is already in such shocking ecological decline. And this is actually pictured in these paintings, although the artists didn't realize at the time what it was leading towards. But the little owl is looking up into his tree, which is dead, but all the grass around is completely green because it's the beginning of the ring barking season, which was the period in Australia. Because living in Australia, I become so aware of this incredible fragility and this shocking extinction that we're living within. So it has made me quite um, activist in my work, I think, um, and becoming more so. So in here, these objects are seriously like little museum objects. They've been transformed by the process in the studio. And then there is also a film, which I'm not sure if I can play, a film about their dreams, their alchemical 
dark life of this dark matter. And what I, I'm, and this whole film is in another part of this, but it's sort of looking at this, um, this life of, this alchemical life of these, of these specimens. But really how all of this has occurred, 20 years ago, I was invited to the Melbourne Museum, yeah, to the Melbourne Museum to make um, an artwork about their storage because this museum was being built without any of the collections being shown. It was at that period, 20 years ago, when everybody wanted everything to be digital and clean. And, and um, so, in fact, it w I was brought in by um, the architects of the museum to create this kind of um, seam into, uh, or what I just designed as a seam into the storage. But what happened, I spent a year in the, um, in the storage of the Melbourne Museum, which became like my studio, and I became incredibly familiar and uh, loving towards all the, the um, species down there. I don't even call them specimens. They became living for me. I forgot they were dead. I would talk to these taxidermy specimens. Oh, what have you been doing all night? And I made little films for them, and I played films of them to one another, and I created all these little kind of scenarios down there because I had this whole place to myself. And this then resulted in um, another video. Um, sorry, I will just go past these. This resulted in my being able to borrow all of these specimens for a, um, for a, um, for, to make my own little museum. <laughs> And so I had my own little natural history museum based on all the museum specimens, but it was in an art museum, which 20 years ago, it was quite a surprise to come across these elements in an art museum. I think now it's very different, but it really started to inform me about how to form an emotional relationship with them and how can we communicate that and how can we make people love all of these animals that have been sacrificed and lost. So I was asking them always, tell me about your life, tell me about, you know, and I thought a lot about their umwelt, of how they, how they, um, how they lived and the inter interconnections that they had with other things in nature. And I, I had this very, very deep um, connection with them that started to inform all my work. And then when I made them into their little museum, I put them sort of on beds and into alchemical um, installations with the sort of substances they might have liked. And why are they those colors and what sort of environment they lived in. So each one had a little tableau, a little story to tell. And um, I found that the, um, um, the good thing is a lot of my work is um, children really love it. <laughs> um, but, and um, it brings out a kind of, um, a pathos and care, and, uh, and this is a very rewarding thing for me as an artist. And so all of these animals, these taxidermied animals, were draped up in mesh and veils, which for me, the veil is a very, very important um, a medium to use that um, it's like coming out of painting. It starts to um, diffuse your vision of something. It creates an ambiguity and it, um, it, the way it's all lit, you can create certain spaces with it. So it's been a big element in a lot of my work. I'm really racing through these, sorry. But the um, astounding thing for me as someone just coming into the collection was to see the enormity of the masses of masses and amount of stuff that then I had to contain in my seam um, for, the, for the museum. Along a 50 meter walkway, you saw that long, huge corridor that it, it's more like a painting. It unfolds, it's not curatorial, it's not scientific. And of course, at that time, the curators were very upset about an artist coming in and doing all this. However, just because we're with all the museum people, in the end, the curators actually loved it and the curators actually started to bring out all the other things from the collection, and so the museum now has a very rich way of showing its collection. I then borrowed all these birds. Um, I was invited to uh, work in a space that's a chapel in a hospital, a chapel for children that died. So it's a very melancholic, circular space. And all I could think of was birds all the birds I'd seen. And so I was able to borrow 800 birds from the Australian Museum and take them into this museum of design, in fact, and 
have them out on two semicircular spirals just hanging at nose height, if you're my height or height. And you ha can have an amazingly intimate engagement with all these birds. And you can look into their blinded eyes and they were just bird skins and they were lying there. And as you can see, I've wrapped around them the emotion they might have been feeling. And also there's the sound of all these birds, but it, it's been made by a lyrebird copying 12 birds. And then the other alarming and terrible thing is that 60% of these birds then were threatened or in fact extinct. And now there would be many more. So you can sort of see how they just hung there on a very floating transparent rings in this very beautiful space. And so this way of working, I was invited then to into this SCAF, which is a Sherman Foundation, which you make the work of your dreams. And I decided mine was to make my own natural history museum for today, a space of the Anthropocene, a space of lost habitats, a space of trying to bring us into touch with what was going on. I did amazing research. I went with Fauna and Flora International to a lot of their sanctuaries, and I ended up in Arche in the elephant camp. I made films. I just um, got very immersed in this sort of life. I worked with the camera trap team and so on and so on, building up all this research. And then I made these kind of cellular spaces that you could see different habitats and they all interact with one another. There was a sound work, several films, and you can sort of see there's these glass, a lot of laboratory glass that houses the substances and things that belong to, to the various species, the, the taxidermid species. Anyway, I also had all the pouch young out, but in, the, in these aqueous solutions, so that there's a lot of play with reflection and mirrors and um, light and the mesh. And it's very, it's very theatrical, the whole environment. And, um, but usually pouch young weren't shown then, and so it was quite um, shocking for some people to see these things, but they were put in ways that were almost like altar-like with plants, or healing plants with them and so on. And then um, I remade a similar work, but this time my research was with the, um, a sanctuary that also had a little natural history museum with it and, a, and pathology and a hospital and everything. And I had all that research and I made this work called Fugitive, which again creates these little tableaus on mirrors in these sort of swollen cellular mesh spaces. And it's just, um, again, these collection of different um, specimens borrowed, again, from the, from the Natural History Museum in Melbourne. And also, in amongst it, a lot of films that, are, that um, so that, that there's this kind of mixture of what's seemingly dead and what's, and what's alive. So the films were on a lot of our native animals, uh, which, of course, are, you know, as I said, rapidly becoming extinct. And, um, and also from the hospital there, and also include, of course, our thylacine, our kind of famous, famous extinct um, animal that everybody's still looking for. And because, of course, what the desire for something once it's lost is so phenomenal. There are teams of people down there in Tasmania on huge mythical searches for this extraordinary animal, which, of course, would have saved the environment of Tasmania had they kept it. And so this, this, this little museum I've made is a mixture of all the collection and images from the, from the research. And of course, then there's an image like of a mine full of animal skeletons. And it's very, very specifically addressing, as I said, this um, habitat loss. Oh, then you can. <laughs> and then you can sort of also see how the light is used, how mirrors are used, how this kind of um, glass, glassiness is used as a way of making things quite jewel-like, something that's normally kept in the dark underground, you know, storage that nobody sees, they're suddenly brought out and um, they, they um, are quite, um, quite shocking but moving are uh, these tiny little marsupial, uh, marsupial fetuses. And then I got invited to make a work for the Paris Climate Talks um, and I thought that, well, clearly the most amazing, you know, um, specific thing would be to do the Great Barrier Reef. I'd already worked there before, and so I went through the Australian Museum, the residency, I went to um, Lizard Island, to their research station, and there I was able to um, 
work in the extension of the museum, in fact, on these outdoor lab laboratories, which is, in fact, a, still a museum. And I also had my own little laboratory, and I took a marine scientist with me, and we just did a lot of uh, researching and work up there. And I did um, the crown of thorns. I got very familiar with them. And um, so <laughs> And I did a lot of underwater setting up of homeopathic treatments of sick and well coral together. Um, this was all to build up my little hospital that I was going to build in, um, in the Australian Museum and in the uh, Natural History Museum in Paris. And as you can sort of see, these little setups um, on the bottom of the sea um, became, I made films and um, a whole series of images. And it's sort of still ongoing, really, this research, because by now the Barrier Reef, as you probably know, is 80% 80 80 um, bleached. Um, these, all these little films, I won't show you the timing, but they, they exist in the world. They, like in Paris next week, I have an exhibition of these films and so on. So they're living in the world, and because people are curious, of course, with the um, with the plight of the Barrier Reef, it's the signal um, coral reef. And all of these films are in negative or they're just black and white. Um, and then I did my little museum, <laughs> flashed through, um, in the Australian Museum. And you can sort of see how it creates this whole kind of space with the mirrors that create this deep infinity going down, a whole collection of um, borrowed specimens from the museum are mixed with this laboratory glass that is tubing and feeding it and feeding it colours. And also I have my own corals that I've made so I can do what I want with them. And, um, you know, they're not museum specimens. You can see I wrap them with colour. They're, they're heavily crafted. In fact, they become like little amputees and little, you know, little prostheses is added to them with glass and things like that. They become kind of little, their own little sculptures. But here they're put into this massive assemblage of, 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 of um, transparent material and, um, and to build up this kind of, well, it's a hospital, but it's also a wunderkammer in the museum. And you can see it's in amongst the collection, but it, it's a very, it's a very um, white, um, white glowing little box. And you can sort of see there's images, there's everything in there. <laughs> and you can see here like this idea of like, is the zoanthelia, which takes the colour out of coral, is it, are we feeding it back in, are we draining it out? So it's got all these little scenarios, again, based on real scientific factual information about what happens to coral. And you can see the, the museum specimens, how they, how they sort of bleed down into the, into, the, um, into, the, into the mirrors and create this deep infinity. And then, uh, in Paris, uh, um, a museum I really love and I have worked in. I've done a lot of work on the glass houses there in the past and, uh, and it was quite a thrill to be able to show there again. <laughs> we see this. But into this already very theatrical environment, I took my, I built my hospital which um, had a completely different feeling. It was very white and luminous inside that very dark and theatrical environment because it has a big film projection projecting over the top of all of these little showcases with the, of the hospital of the corals. So very similar to the others, but this is a much bigger piece and it borrows a lot from Paris. Also the Australian Museum sent a lot of their specimens over there. And it was a, a huge undertaking and it was most um, remarkable experience, but especially to be in Paris for the climate talks um, with the work. And as you can see, that the whole play of shadows and light and the whole atmosphere it sets up is very, very important. And you can see that it's got all sorts of things like coal, you know, killing the coral and so on. But one of the things I haven't mentioned is often, like in the Hospital for Plants and in this, there's a lot of relationship to the medical systems of um, humans so that people kind of have a more of an empathy with something because how do you give a psychological dimension to coral? And I'm so struggling with it at the moment with all my plant work. How do I give my plants a real psychological dimension? How do I make people love them? You know what I mean? The way we can more easily love the big sentient animals. And so um, I think sometimes this medical thing that it's a bit like the humans um, how, you, how you administer the medicine is one of the ways that I've done that. 
And then um, just very recently in, um, in um, Oldenburg, I was able to borrow from the very beautiful Natural History Museum um, from their shell collection. And it, I was invited to this show called Nautilus in the Schloss Museum, in, which is a beautiful historic art museum in Oldenburg. And so really, it's quite a simple um, project. I won't show you the film, but I, um, I borrowed all of these uh, shell specimens that looked like nothing in their drawers, and I call the work Lost Habitats, because again, how do we give the shell some sort of feeling and relationship? And they were homes once for little animals that are now gone. And so I formed this little wunderkammer at the end of this huge, beautiful photographic show on the history of the shell, and, um, and it, it finishes the exhibition. It, 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 the exhibition finalises in this work, which is just really a totally within one of the cabinets of the museum. It's completely contained, and it's really, it's just from the shells down the road, and it's, it's just a very kind of very specific exhibition about these lost habitats and looking and the ability to look at the amazing forms of all of these shells. And then that's my last slide. And then I actually have a film, but we won't have time for the film unless we, in, yes, I will. Okay, if you wanted to see it, it's again, um, I'll just tell you, it's based on having a residency with a zoo, which I think of still as a type of museum. But it's also that way I've been informing um, myself about how to relate to all of these disappearing animals in the world. How can we, what can we do? And I just wanted to finish with a quote um, from um, Vincien Despre. Um, the world dies from each absence. Each being matters in the fabric of its sensations. Every sensation of every being in the world is a mode through which the world lives and feels itself and through which it exists. When being is no more, the world narrows all of a sudden and part of a reality collapses each time an existence disappears. It is a piece of the universe of sensations that fades away. And I think for me that whole underlying um, awareness of extinction is really um, prompting me to try and ask art to address this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>